We've been looking at the story of the Good Shepherd of Bethlehem, who is referred to over a thousand times in the Old Testament alone. This man rose at the age of 30 to be king, just as Joseph at the age of 30 became lord over all the land of Egypt, and as Jesus, their great antitype, became master and lord when anointed at that same age in Jordan. I want to look with you at a psalm that the shepherd king wrote. We've kept the best wine until now. I'm referring to a psalm that he wrote in great distress, a psalm that is called the Crucifixion Psalm. It begins and ends with the words of Calvary. I'm reading Psalm 22. In Hebrew, it's a psalm of sobs, staccato. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer, and by night, and find no rest. Yet thou art holy, and thee our fathers trusted. But I am a worm, and no man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. He delights in him. Yet thou art he who took me from the womb. Upon thee was I cast from my birth. Be not far from me. Trouble is near. There is none to help. Many encompass me, surround me, open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart's like wax. It's melted. My strength's dried up. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. You've put me in the dust of death. Dogs are round about me. They encircle me. And they've pierced my hands and my feet. And I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my raiment they cast lots. But thou, O Lord, be not far off. O thou my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver my life. Save me. And then it changes. The glorious notes of victory. I will tell of thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I'll praise thee. He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not hid his face from him. He has heard when he cried to him. From thee comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I'll pay before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All families of the nation shall worship before him. The dominion belongs to the Lord. And to him shall all the proud of the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. A posterity shall serve him. Men shall tell of the Lord to the coming generation. Proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, that he has done it, or that it is finished. Here's a psalm written by David when in great distress, when his enemies were many, when sometimes he feared that his life would be snuffed out before morning, and in his sorrows he prefigures the great sorrows of his antitype. And our Lord on the cross thought through this psalm from verse 1 to the end of the psalm itself. So our Lord takes two passages from it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The opening breath of this despairing lament. And then in his last cry, it is finished. So into thy hands I commit my spirit. So our Lord meant we should look at this psalm and with good reason, it speaks of him being like a worm and despised and scoffed at and being mocked. And the people saying, let God rescue him. And when he says, bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me, the Israelites called other nations by those terms. The Romans to the Jews were bulls of Bashan. That was their name for the heathen. 
So this sufferer is surrounded by the heathen. And he says, my bones are out of joint, I'm poured out. I can count all my bones. So it's using a form of suffering and torment and death that was not known to the Israelites, but was known to the pagans, where the bones are out of joint, where the bones stand out with the strain of it, where you die of gradual strangulation, exacerbated by horrible thirst. He says that his tongue cleaves to his jaws. There's no one to help him but God. He prays to God, save me. And then the last part of the psalm from 22 to 31 is a hymn of praise because God has heard his prayer. He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not hid his face. The beginning of the psalm says, you've hid your face. That's the way it seemed. Really, God loved the sufferer. He's not hid his face. When he cried, God heard. And then he promises to praise God to his brethren. What sort of people were the brethren of David? And <clears throat> Let me read to you from 1 Samuel where it mentions the brethren of this man who ultimately became a great king. What sort of people were the brethren of David? Listen. Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. You and I might not be very proud to be captain of such a group. The discontented, the distressed, those in debt. But my friends, that's you and me. It's when the world makes us discontented, when we see we're in debt to God, that we rally to our great captain. This is the one that the psalm says, these are the people to whom he will turn and praise God. And notice, all the ends of the earth will remember this. Here's the gospel, the message will go to the ends, to all nations. All families of the nations are going to worship because of this suffering. And all that bow down to the dust will one day worship before him. And he'll have descendants, spiritual seed that'll serve him, that'll tell to the coming generation and proclaim his deliverance, his redemption, his salvation to a people yet unborn, that he's finished it, that he's accomplished it. Beautiful psalm of the cross. Now I want to look briefly at the story of the ancestors of King David, who are also the ancestors of Jesus. And the most prominent one is a woman, a heathen, one exiled by law, but admitted by grace. There are two books in the Bible that carry the name of women. One is of a Gentile that marries a Jew, the other is a Jew that marries a Gentile. One's Ruth, one's Esther. Ruth's name stands in the genealogy of Jesus. We're going to look briefly at her book. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, notice, Bethlehem. While this book's about Ruth, it's also about Jesus. A certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, the name of the two sons were Marlon and Kilion. Now Elimelech means my God is king, Naomi means pleasantness. Marlon and Kilion are not names you'd give your children. Sick and pining. Probably born in the famine in the land, which makes them move out. Sometimes it's so tough at church you think you ought to give it up. Go out in the world, they'll treat me better out there. You'll only go for a little while to sojourn. The danger is that like a limelech you may die there. And so this first chapter introduces widowhood and want and woe. When a man who left the people of God for a while to tarry in the world dies there and his sons die there and there's only the widow. But she's one of three widows because those two dead sons before their death had married. One had married a woman called Orpah and the others married a woman called Ruth. And Naomi says to the girls, I'm going home. We made a mistake to leave the church, go out in the world. I'm going back. I did the wrong thing. You better go back to your people. 
And Orpah kisses her and says, I'm off. Ruth kisses her and says, I'm staying. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also. If even death parts me from you, what a woman Naomi must have been. What a woman Ruth must have been. They get back at the time of barley harvest. The next chapter introduces the hero. Naomi had a kinsman of a husband, a man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Boaz means in him strength. Ruth said to Naomi, let me go gleaning. She said, go. She went and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. They said, the Lord bless you. And Boaz said, whose maiden is this? They said, it's the Moabite maiden who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, let me glean and gather among the sheaves of the reapers. So she came and she's continued, worked hard all morning without resting even for a moment. She was quite a woman. Boaz calls Ruth, listen my daughter, don't feel you've got to go to another field, you're welcome here, but keep close to all the girls that work here. I've charged the young men, they must not molest you. Whenever you're thirsty, help yourself. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said, why have I found favour in your eyes? You should take notice of me when I'm a foreigner. And Boaz answers her graciously regarding what he's heard and he finishes his word by saying, the Lord God of Israel, under his wings you've come to trust. And she said, you're very gracious to me, my Lord. You've comforted me. You've spoken kindly to your maidservant. At mealtime, Boaz calls her to lunch. Come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel in this wine. She sat beside the reapers. He passed, passed her the parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and there was still some left over. Then Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the sheaves, don't reproach her, and pull out some of the bundles for her and drop it purposely so she can get some of the good stuff. Don't rebuke her. So she goes home to her mother-in-law all laden up and the mother-in-law says, where were you today? Blessed whoever cared for you, be the man. She says, well the man with whom I worked, his name was Boaz. Naomi says, blessed be God, that's wonderful. The man's a relative, he's one of our near kin. And Ruth said, he also said, I can stay there till the end of the harvest and glean. Naomi says, it's well my daughter, do what he says. So she kept close to the maidens of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the par barley and wheat harvest. Chapter 3, Naomi, her mother-in-law, one day says to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you? That's what the Hebrew says, rest. Some translations say, should I not seek a home for you? But it meant the same thing. A single girl was not at rest till she was married. So Ruth gets a proposition, not from a man, but from a woman. Go down to Boaz tonight, when all his men are sleeping around him, waken him up, be it, do it quietly, you don't disturb their surrounding sleepers, and tell him he's a kinsman redeemer. Tell him he's related to your dead husband. Tell him that if he wants to, he can marry you. Wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, go down, don't make yourself known to the man till he's finished. That's a great word in this book. Finished, finished, finished. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, observe the place. Go down and lie down beside him and tell him he's a near kinsman. And Ruth says, all you say, I'll do. This is the time of the Passover. This is the time when men are harvesting and they all sleep on the threshing floor, all these workers with the Lord of the harvest. Boaz is the Lord of the harvest. So Ruth, who has a reputation for virtue, will come to Boaz, who also has a reputation for virtue. She can't do this in the marketplace by day. She'll do it when he's surrounded by other men, but they're sleeping and she'll whisper, you are a near kinsman, which is what she does. In verse 9 she says, spread your skirt over your maidservant. The symbol of marriage was to spread a skirt over the girl. 
He says, Blessed be you of the Lord, my daughter. You haven't followed after young men, whether poor or rich. I'll do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know you're a woman of virtue. It's true, I am a near kinsman, but there's a kinsman nearer than I. If he'll do the work of a kinsman, fine. If not, I'll do it. Go to sleep. And in the morning he gives her a lot of food to take to her mother-in-law. And in verse 18, Naomi says, Wait, my daughter, till you learn how the matter turns out. The man will not rest till he's finished the matter today. Finished. 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 And then in the next chapter, the last chapter, Boaz goes to the central part of the city for advertising, for public proclamations at the gate, and he calls the near kinsman. He says, look, Ruth's got a parcel of land. He's a widow. You're a nearer kinsman. You can marry her. No, says the man, there's someone else that's closer to me than her. I cannot marry her. I cannot redeem her. And Boaz says, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And the story finishes in verse 13 that Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. The Lord gives her a son. And the women say to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who hasn't left you this day without next of kin. May his name be renowned in Israel. It's been that. He's the father of one of the ancestors of David. He'll be to you a restore of life and nourish of your old age. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons has borne him. And then it tells us, a son's been born to Naomi. It was really to Ruth. They named him Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then it repeats it at the very end, so you can't miss the point. Obed of Jesse and Jesse of David. The story is our story. The heathen woman represents all of us. We were all born heathen. We're all a long way away from the church of God by birth. No Moabite could enter the congregation till the tenth generation. The law excluded her. The law excludes us. The law demands an obedience that's flawless, willing, fervent, constant, uninterrupted, consistent, and it demands a perfect nature as well as a perfect performance. It demands perfect motives, perfect thoughts, perfect feelings, and perfect deeds from the womb to the tomb. And you might as well shoot us because none of us can do that. The law excludes us. That's part of the good news, the gospel, that you're not under law, that you're under grace. Sin won't have dominion over you. You're not under law. The new covenant's not based on law. It recognizes law because the fruit of love to Jesus is always obedience to his known will. The law is a perfect standard. It's a terrible method. So Ruth represents all of us heathen, excluded by law. But we meet one who's Lord of the harvest, in whom is strength and grace and generosity. And he speaks kindly to us. He stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me in. I'll sup with you and you with me. The kind words to Ruth, the eating together, symbolize the relationship between the Saviour and his redeemed. Our saviour's become our kinsman redeemer. It was the law in old Israel that a relative could marry the widow. So Christ took our nature, everything except sin, fully human, just as human as though not at all divine, and just as divine as though not at all human, but without spot on the outside, without blemish on the inside. He knew no sin, in him was no sin. He only had the likeness of sinful flesh. He's my kinsman. He's my kinsman, Redeemer. And at Passover time, the time when Ruth lay down beside him, our Lord Jesus redeemed us. He slept on the cross as Boaz slept on the threshing floor. You know it was a threshing floor that became the foundation for the temple where the foundation, where the sacrifices were offered. So our Lord of the harvest lay down asleep at Passover time that he might spread his skirt over us, his robe of righteousness, that we might be accepted, that we might be numbered among the children of God. 
That's the good news of the book of Ruth, that we who are excluded by law are welcomed by grace. This is the theme of the whole Bible. We have time to look at one more brief story found twice in Scripture, and whenever the Scripture repeats itself, it's not stuttering. It is talking about something that's very important. Now I'm going to read to you very quickly from the last verses of the book of Kings, Second Kings. It's telling the same story as Ruth. Verse 27 of the last chapter of Second Kings. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seat of the kings who were with him in Babylon. And Jehoiachin put off his prison garments and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king. Every day a portion as long as he lived. Here's the story of a rebel king, Jehoiachin. He's rebelled against the great king. And so he goes into a dungeon for five years, for ten, for fifteen, for twenty, for twenty-five, for thirty, for thirty-five, for thirty-six, for thirty-seven years, Jehoiachin is in prison. Those who'd been old are now dead. Those who'd been young when he went in are now middle-aged. Those who were middle-aged when he went in are now old. And he's weak, and he's worn, and he's sad. He has a dirty beard that reaches the floor. The cockroaches find their way in and through it. He has white straggly hair. He's only a bag of bones. His hope of getting out of the prison? Nil. Absolutely nil. But a new king comes on the throne, and he hears about this old prisoner, this rebel king, this bag of bones, and the new king reaches down and plucks out the prisoner who's helpless to save himself. And he calls him up to the throne room and he says, you've been a rebel. You've been in prison. I'm forgiving you. Oh, what kind words he spoke. I'm not only forgiving you, I'm going to give you a place at my table. We're going to fatten you up. You're going to have a constant allowance to meet all your needs for every day of your life, and may they be many. What kind words. It's my story. It's your story. Through our representatives, we rebelled against the great king. We've been in the prison house of sin. The God anointed one to preach good tidings to the poor, and the opening of the prison house to them that are bound. And King Jesus has reached down into the prison house and he's gathered us up by grace. He brings us to his father's house and he gives us a new robe. He throws off the old prison garments of sin. Now we're clothed in white and we sit at his table and we have a constant allowance given us for every day. We have to learn to build a little house of faith around ourselves and live one day at a time. And the Lord spoke about praying, give us this day our daily bread. He has in mind the sort of thing that your Jehoiachin experienced. The king made provision for him for every day's need. So when you and I accept the grace of God, we allow him to lift us up out of the pit. He strips us of the old rags. He forgives our rebellion. He gives us a new status. Now we are kings with him at the royal palace. And he makes a constant allowance for us. He promises to keep us day by day till the end of our lives so that we can say underneath and round about and over our heads are the everlasting arms and he who possesses those will never leave us, never forsake us. We are his and he is ours. We hated but he loves. We rebelled, he saved. Law can't help us but his grace redeems us.